All right, so today we're going to go through and do a little bit of review, seeing how uh, I've been there the last couple of days, and it looks like I'm not going to be here again on Wednesday. So I figure let's go through Chapter 4 and the first part of Chapter 5. I'll highlight some of the more important things that you need to know, and uh, hopefully that will be enough to get you started. So um, what we want to concentrate on for the first video here is I want to concentrate on carbon. Remember that carbon is really the backbone of all biological things. Back when you guys took biology in your 10th grade year, we talked about all the macromolecules. We talked about carbohydrates. We talked about proteins. We talked about uh, lipids. And then we also talked about nucleic acids. And the primary component that was found in all those things is carbon. So when you take away the water from a cell, the majority of the remainder of all the cells that make up a human organism is made up of carbon-based compounds. And once again, it's those four, primarily those four macromolecules that I just mentioned, which is going to be our next topic after this one. Uh, just to give you a heads up before I go any farther, you notice on some of these PowerPoints I've gone through and the things that I consider to be more of the essential information for the unit, I put into a blue text like you can see here. I'm moving over with the cursor. The stuff in the black text is going to be more of the uh, more secondary stuff, just things that help to develop the stuff that's in the blue text. And if my eyes look really stupid, which I'm sure they do because it's recording my face and I can't see it, um, that's because I'm trying to look at the screen, I'm trying to look at my notes, trying to look at a little bit of everything. So uh, part of my, my stupid lookingness, I guess. So um, to go along with this, the, the whole carbons thing, Proteins, DNA, carbohydrates, and other molecules are the things that are primarily composed of carb compounds. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, assuming you guys have copies of these notes, or you can get copies of these notes for yourselves. I'll also post this video for you guys to be able to access later. All right, so you can see a nice pretty waterfall with the all kinds of things here that are going to be carbon-based. Look at all the different living uh, organisms in here. We're going to look at the carbon structures inside of plants. We'll look at some of the carbon structures inside of animals as well, and we'll especially concentrate on that when we get into carbohydrates well, uh, as part of the first section of Chapter 5. All right, so uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is the fact that organic chemistry is the study of carbon compounds. Many of you that have already said you want to do something medical related or you're interested in doing something that's uh, more of a biology basis, you're going to be taking an organic chemistry class and you're going to be going through and spending a tremendous amount of time looking at the chemistry behind carbon because that's the whole basis for the class. It's an interesting class, but I'll tell you it's a pretty tough class too. I'll let you guys sort that out for yourselves when you get there. Um, organic compounds are can be very simple. They can have one carbon that makes them up or they can be quite big ones. There's carbon compounds out there that have thousands of carbons that make it up. Most organic compounds are also going to contain hydrogen atoms, and we have specific names for those, and I, I believe we talked about those in, in chemistry, and we actually talked about them in physical science, too. Uh, we call those the hydrocarbons. You know, you come in contact with several hydrocarbons on a regular basis, and I believe we'll get into that here a little bit later on. I'm not too worried about the, the rest of this. Just recognize that the laws of physics and chemistry obviously apply to life. And so you can see this guy here looking at something kind of cool. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. All right, so uh, the other thing I want to look at is the fact that carbon atoms, because of their structure, and primarily because of their electron configuration, they're able to bond uniquely compared to all other atoms. In fact, they can form four different bonds all at the same time. And so as a result of their electron co configuration, that carbon has the properties that it actually has. Now, going back to our discussion when I was last there on Friday, we talked, or when we did the chemistry review, excuse me, I talked about uh, the fact that carbon has four valence electrons. What this really means is that carbon has four electrons that are ready, or excuse me, readily available for um, going through and forming bonds with four other substances in order to fulfill that octet rule. And so there's a name for that, and it's called a tetravalence. Tetra is just the prefix in, in uh, organic chemistry for the number four. And it, because of its tetravalence, because of the fact that it has four valence electrons, it makes it so that these compounds can be quite large and complex, which means that there's going to be a wide variety of different molecules that can form using the same ingredients over and over and over again. 
So it's the four valence electrons. Uh, molecules that have multiple carbons, the carbon um, bonded to four, it's going to be form, forming, excuse me, atoms with four. Uh, I'm messing this up. Let me try this over again. It's going to form multiple bonds with four other atoms at the same time. When you look at the shape as a result of that, it's going to be what they call a tetrahedron. I'm going to have a picture that will show you that here in just a second. When carbon atoms are joined by a double bond, though, because of the shared pairs of electrons, it's going to give it a different shape. And so uh, we're going to call, say it's a flat shape. It's going to be more similar to what you see if you were to draw it on a piece of paper. All right, so here's the, the pictures that I was just talking about. Uh, some of the more common substances that <clears throat> you may have talked about when you were in physical science or in chemistry was you, you looked at methane, so CH4. We can see a structural formula here. We can see the, um, the bone stick model, which is the 3D representation of it. When you look at the 3D representation of it, uh, you can notice because of the three dimensions, when you draw it on paper, it comes in at 90 degree bond angles. But when you talk about three dimensions, the bond angle between the hydrogens here and the carbons are going to be 109.5 degrees instead of the 90 degrees that you're drawing on your paper. So uh, one of the key points I want you to recognize is that in a tetrahedron shape, these bond angles are going to be 109.5 degrees. That plays a big role in determining uh, the types of bonds that it can form, and then also will have an impact on the structural ability of these substances when they combine together in, in multiples, so when the monomers get together and form polymers. Hopefully you've heard those terms if you haven't, and we're going to be reviewing those here in a few minutes. Then you can see with ethane, the C2H6, and once again, you can see it's forming a tetrahedron as a result of it being a three-dimensional shape. And the space filling model is just the model that helps to show the shape. And then finally, you can see this one, ethylene here, which is showing the double bond. You notice it doesn't have the tetrahedral shape. You know, it doesn't have this pyramid characteristic. It has instead more of a flat shape. All right, so just a little bit of review with that. So then, it's really, like I said before, the electron configuration that makes this have the, uh, that unique shape. All right, when you look at carbon, it's going to most often form these bonds in its tetrahedron with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and itself. So really the four key elements, which we talked about already, for living organisms are hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and then also carbon. So they, essentially these are the, the four most important. We're going to talk about two others that are going to be important in macromolecules. We'll throw in um, sulfur and phosphorus here a little bit later on when we get into more specific stuff on some of the classifications of hydrocarbons. So just a reminder on the, the octet rule and looking at the, the valence electrons. Remember, they want to try to form eight. And so you can see here with oxygen, it only has six, so it's willing to share two of them. Nitrogen wants to have eight as well. It has five, so it's willing to share three of them. Carbon has four. It wants four. Therefore, it's willing to share four. So it's willing. That's just another way of saying carbon will bond with four different things at a time. Nitrogen can form with bond with three different things at a time. Oxygen with two things at a time. I, now, when you look at all this, you can take many, 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 many of these carbons and combine them together to form very long chains. You know, you're, when you hear about starches, that's a good example of a chain that's quite, quite long. Um, and it's a result of repeating elements coming to, well, elements isn't the right word, repeating units coming together and attaching over and over and over. And as a result, you get a very large molecule. All right. So I think I repaired these. Let's see if this actually works. The carbon backbones of organic molecules may vary in length and in location of single and double bonds. Molecules may be straight or branched and may even contain rings of atoms. All right, so you can see the various shapes. So um, be aware that you can have straight chains where they're all in an even line. You can have branched chains. You can see there's three here and there's one branched off from it. You can also have ring structures. So when we get into some of the, the basis of the um, 
Uh, I'm trying to think of the term I want to use here. When we start getting into the basics behind the um, functional groups, you're going to see that there's going to be different structures that are going to give the substances different properties based upon which of these structures it actually has. And hold on a second, I gotta I take care of a family thing. Jamie, can you turn off his iPod, please? Sorry about that. All right, so let's keep going with this. Close that back out. So you can see some of the different shapes that you have here. You have your straight chains. You can see we have branch chains as well. You can see uh, that we also have ring shapes. And then you can have double bonds in here and uh, single bonds. In some cases, you have triple bonds. Right, some of these you also notice are some common ones. You, I'm assuming you've heard of propane. I'm assuming you've heard of butane. Um, so, right, so the name that we use for these substances that are primarily made up of hydrogen and carbon. So it's primarily made of carbon and hydrogen. We call it a hydrocarbon. Look at the name. It actually makes sense. Another one of the few cases where biology made a name that actually fits. All right, so some of these molecules that are um, classified as hydrocarbons are fats. All right, and uh, you'll see that when we talk about fats. I should start showing you some of the structures of fats. You'll see that there's a lot of carbon and hydrogen that's bonded together um, to make those molecules up. All right, and then these are also used often as your, your energy currency. That's why you saw back on the previous slide, at, or propane, butane, both are sources of fuel. You know, you're using this to cook on your grill. You're using this to light a lighter. Octane, the stuff that's burning in the engine of your vehicle. That's another example. Um, la 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 la, I'm trying to think of the other name. Candle wax is C25H52, and for some reason, I can't remember the name of it right now. Once again, though, it's a fuel. So many hydrocarbons are used as fuels because of the fact that when you burn the bonds that hold the carbons together, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. Paraffin is the name of the, the candle wax, by the way. So you can see the fat molecule here. You can see you got carbon here with, and um, hydrogen's all bonding off from it. I, another structural thing you should be aware of is the fact that sometimes you're going to have these substances that have the same molecular formula, but they might look slightly different. All right, and if they look different, it's going to cause them to have different properties. And the name of the substances that are, have the same molecular formula but they have different structures, we call those isomers. And hopefully that's a review term for you too. There's different types of, of isomers. There's structural isomers where the covalent arrangements of their atoms are going to be different from one another. You know, the branch versus straight chain, that's going to be an example of a structural isomer. Geometric isomers have the same covalent arra arrangements, but they're in a different spatial um, arrangement. That means they're just existing on a different plane. And so sometimes you have it flipped over. An important one for biology that I want you to be familiar with is an antimers. Excuse me, an antimers. These are isomers that are mere images of one another. And these are unique because in many cases, when you have one enantiomer, it has a good purpose. And then when you have another one that's just the mere image of it, all of a sudden um, it has... No, no point to it. All right, so let me show you this picture, and I'll come back to the video in a second. So you can see the, the structural isomers. The big one that I, I want you to notice is, like I said, the enantiomers. So I have one isomer and another isomer. They're mirror images of, the other, of one another. So you can look at it like your hands. When you have your hands like this, they're mirror images of one another. When you bring them together... They come together. So when you have the mirror image like this, this one might have a, a biological function that could help out primarily, let's say, in medicine. I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Whereas this one, even though it has all the same stuff, it still has five fingers, still has a palm, still has the same blood vessels, the same arrangement, just in a slightly different location, has a completely different um, use in the body. And in some cases, when we're using it for medicine, it's going to cause it to not be effective at all. So let me go back and show you uh, this little video because they say it better than I do here. And I'm hoping these vid videos are showing up. If not, Three types of isomers are structural isomers, which differ in the covalent partnerships between their atoms, geometric isomers, which vary in arrangement of atoms around a double bond, 
enantiomers, or stereoisomers, which are molecules that are mirror images of each other, like left and right hands. That's not the one I thought it was. Sorry about that. And like I said, if these aren't showing up, I'm sorry. I'm recording using a different way, so. Alright, so like I was saying with the enantiomers, uh, in some cases we've had problems with this with drugs. An example of that is, I believe it was L-dopamine. Let me look at my notes a second. Um, yeah, L-dopa was an isomer that was a very effective treatment for uh, Parkinson's disease. And so that particular isomer did a great job of trying to take care of some of the symptoms that are associated with Parkinson's disease, whereas the flip of it, the, the mirror image of it, had zero effect. An even better example, and I can't find it here in my notes, um, thalidomide. Thalidomide was a drug where one, it had two different isomers. There were any isomers of one another. The one in the antiomer was effective in treating um, morning sickness. And so it was being prescribed uh, often to uh, pregnant women to try to take care of the, their symptoms of uh, the constant vomiting. Well, they then, in the process of manufacturing all this, they made both isomers of the substance. Well, the thing that they found out later was that the mere image of that one, so the enantiomer of the one that was effective, actually caused birth effects. And so um, after having quite a few um, patients that had symptoms that showed that these birth effects were a result of the medication being given to them, the chemistry labs that were developing these realized, hey, wait a minute, the L version is causing problems, whereas the D version is not. And that's typically the two letters they use for the different um, enantiomers. So um, let me see, like I said, if this video doesn't show up, you guys can pull this up for yourself, and it should work when you guys load these. Isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formulas, but different three-dimensional structures. The difference between isomers can literally mean the difference between life and death. L-DOPA, shown on the left, reduces the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Its isomer R-DOPA, on the right, has no effect on the disease. And once again, I was wrong on the video. I thought this was the video that showed the um, birth control one, but I'm wrong. Also, you get to listen to some of the, the family drama going on here. So you know, we got to get our son to bed. He's over there still awake, and mom's not, mom's not happy about that. But we can talk about that when I come back. All right, so you can see this is just a mirror image of one another. This one was ineffective. This one was effective. I think I've beaten that horse uh, or dead horse pretty well. It's time to move on. Then here's the thing where basically I, I gotta tell you guys, you're gonna have to memorize stuff. It's just the way it is. Um, cause you gotta start being able to recognize some of these functional groups. So then when we look at these molecules more, more in depth, you can start to notice some of the structures that cause them to have the properties that they have. Alright, so it's really the functional groups that get attached to the organic molecules that cause them to get involved in chemical reactions. And so everything that's going on in your body is a result of these chemical reactions going on. And so the location, the number of these functional groups are going to have uh, an impact on the role of what that molecule has inside the body. And so we got to be able to recognize where these functional groups are located and then be able to identify how many there are and as a result you're going to find out that it has um, different properties based upon the arrangement and numbers of those uh, functional groups. So, um, for example, you can see there's this main structure of this substance is right here. You notice in the female lion and in the uh, male lion, this part is exactly the same. The only difference between these two things is this part that's attached on the very end. We call this then the functional group. All right, and this happens to be the hormone that causes uh, more feminine characteristics. Thus, it's found in female lion. And then I'm assuming you're familiar with testosterone, which causes the male characteristics in a lion. The six functional groups that I'm going to hold you accountable for, you should recognize what a hydroxyl group is, a carbonyl group, a carboxyl group, an amino group, a sulfhydro group, 
and a fast figure. And I believe, if, if memory serves me right now, I haven't been in a few days, so I, I, I don't quite remember. I believe this is in a table format on your study guides. And so that'd be a great thing for you to use to help guide yourself with recognizing the differences between these. All right, and so I'm going to go through this quite quickly at this point. Um, the hydroxyl group is nothing more than an OH. And so you want to look inside the structure, and if you see an OH attached to it, you know that it has a hydroxyl group. Most of the time, um, things that have hydroxyl groups are classified as alcohols. And so when you look at the name of the substance, you'll find an OL on the end of it. All right, so we have hydroxyl groups. Carbonyl groups are going to have a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen on the end of it. So when you look here at acetone, you can see there's a carbon in here that's double bonded to an oxygen. We call that then a carbonyl group. Carbonyl groups can be found in one of two locations. If you find a carbonyl group inside the chain, so if it's not on one of the end carbons, we call it a ketone. So if it's inside the, uh, the straight chain, we call it a ketone. If it is found on the outside of the carbon chain, so you can see this is on the, the last carbon, we call it an aldehyde. Alright, so you can see that down here. Ketones is going to be within the carbon skeleton, so it's going to be within that straight chain, whereas an aldehyde is going to be on the outside of it. Carboxyl groups are slightly different because they're a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, but they also have a single bond to a hydroxyl group. So you got to be careful when you're looking at those hydroxyl groups. You got to make sure that it's not also attached to a carbonyl group because if it is, we call it a different classification. We call it a carboxyl group. All right, these are typically going to form an acid. A good example of that is acetic acid. So you can see that there's a carboxyl group on the very end of the acetic acid. As a result of this, uh, usually causing it to be an acid, it's going to typically have the properties that are associated with acids. All right, amino groups, these are going to have nitrogen in them. So a way to remember that is in amino you have an N. So you also have an N here. And an amino group is going to be nothing more than a nitrogen bonded to two separate hydrogens. All right, so we're going to call the, this an amine group. So you can see glycine here. Um, it has a um, carboxyl group on one end. And then you can see it has this amino group on the other. All right, typically these are going to then act as bases. <coughs> All right, you have sulfhydro, and hopefully you can figure that one out. Sulf going with sulfur, hydro going with hydrogen, and you can see that on the end here. Um, typically, the name of these are going to have thiol at the end. And then finally, we have our phosphates. Now, I don't remember if you remember back to biology class, but when we talk about phosphate, phosphate is nothing more than a phosphorus that is attached to four different oxygens. One of those oxygens is going to have um, a double bond on it. So when you're looking at the a structure, if you see a phosphate group attached anywhere on it, it's going to then be con this is going to be considered to have a phosphate functional group. All right, so just a quick run through on those. Like I said, I believe you already have a table that has it set up so that you can put the, all this stuff side by side. And hopefully you already have that done anyway because you're supposed to be working on that earlier. All right, so then um, 